Hi there, and welcome to the Homestead Education Podcast. Do you have a homestead, farm, or just dream of a rural life? This is a show to help you and your kids grow your own food and grow as a person. I'm your host, Cody Hanner. I'm a homesteader, homeschool mama six, and small town enthusiast. I was raised by an old school rancher and blessed by the grace of God to have been exposed to so much of what rural life has to offer. Join me every week to talk about homesteading, homeschooling, and growth with a homestead education. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Homestead Education Podcast. Today, I have Michelle Miller on, known as the Farm Babe. She is a published writer, speaker, and farm advocate. I am so excited to have you on in chat today. So welcome. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. So do you want to introduce yourself a little bit more? Tell us some about what you do. Sure. I'm Michelle Miller, known as the Farm Babe, and I work to bridge the gap between consumers and farmers. So I started my social media outreach almost nine years ago as a way to better bridge the gap between consumers and farmers. There's a lot of misinformation out there. So I was farming on a larger scale farm in Iowa, corn, soybeans, hay, cattle, sheep, all that good stuff, and was just really getting fed up with a lot of the misinformation that's out there. And so I just took it upon myself to kind of debunk these myths when people are like, oh, GMOs are just drenched in Roundup and whatever and all these things and I was like you know there's like real people behind this stuff and it's farmers like us who care and you know we had mm-hmm. earned a work farmer of the year for soil and water conservation and all this stuff we're doing a lot of good things um, but like that story doesn't always get told like a lot of people think like oh you know small farms are good and big farms are bad but the reality is like any farm can do a great job regardless of mm-hmm. size and so I work to tell the story of all farms of all shapes and sizes and labels and just try to highlight agriculture overall because it takes a village to feed everyone you know um it yeah. does absolutely yeah so I've been doing it about nine years and I travel as a keynote speaker and a advocate and um, a social media influencer in the farm space so I do a lot of sponsored um, farm tours and work with universities and ag businesses and farmers to um, really capture their stories and post that on social so I'm always traveling speaking and then I'm a columnist for a few publications and do a lot of social media outreach so keeps me busy but it's uh every day is different so I love it I love that you know I we were chatting a little bit before we came on that that's kind of been my mission is to just bridge that gap as well except I do it a lot with the kids is you know our kids are the furthest removed from the family farm sociologically and being able to teach them where our food comes from especially after what's happened over the last few years I think has been a really big um, movement with both, you know, with everybody. And, you know, I call it, I've heard it called like Homestead Tsunami by Joel Salatin, but I always joke that I call it just, it's just a learning revolution that people are ready to learn and know where their food comes from. And that disconnect is what has caused both really bad misinformation, but also people who are really ready to learn. Yeah, exactly. Well, and I think Joel Salton, a a good example of that is like, he does a lot of things right um, as kind of like a small scale farm, Mm -hmm. but he's also a big perpetuator of misinformation. And so it's like a lot of things he says, like I can't stand because it's like, there's so much misinformation around large scale farms, but it's like, we we have to just respect each other and Mm -hmm. understand that we can't make assumptions just because a farm is a certain size that it's, Mm -hmm. you know, like and so that drives me crazy because I'm like you know like just because we do things differently doesn't mean that we have to like put down others you know right I yo, I totally can agree with that you know it's um it's everybody just has like a different model and like you said we're far like as farmers I I'm a small scale farmer at this point but I worked in commercial ag for 10 years as farmers we we are people we're just doing the best to feed our families to feed the world yeah and sometimes our choices are the best and sometimes there are those that are stuck in kind of the cycle as well so it's just a uh... exactly well it's great to see that you have um experience in both sides too you mm-hmm. know what I mean? yeah <laughs> Do farmers markets. I used to sell direct, you know, just small scale type farm stuff too, even though we had a commercial. So I was a farmer in Iowa with my now ex-boyfriend. So we were farming together in Iowa for about eight years. And then I just moved down to Florida a couple of years ago during the pandemic. So now I'm on a little timber farm down here in Florida. And, um, but it was fun because it's like, we have like this larger scale type commercial farm, which is pretty standard of Iowa, like corn, soybean stuff. 
but I still was doing farmer's markets. And so it's one of those things where it's like, you have like a small scale farm vibe and I was selling meat at markets and like local small grocery artisan stores. So it's fun because mm-hmm. you know right where it goes. And when you're selling into different markets, it's also fun because it's like, I could see a barge going down the Mississippi river and be like, wow, like we could have grown those soybeans that are being exported to China right now. Or I can get a text message from my neighbor saying, hey, those T-bones you sold me at the farmer's market are like the best T-bones I've ever had. And my wife and I had them on our anniversary. And so it's those beautiful stories that mm-hmm. you, whether it's the small, whether you have just a small garden or you're growing tens of thousands of acres, you know what I mean? Right. Well, and that's actually kind of one of the pieces that led me into the small scale farming. I mean, I grew up on a cattle ranch, but we weren't huge. Right. Um, I think at one point we had 300 heads. I mean, that's pretty large, but in the mountains of California, a lot of people were running that many head, Um, which yes, I know California ruins everything, but (laughs) 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 Um, you know, when people, people don't realize what it's really like there. Yeah. Um, But I worked in the commercial ag. I was a food safety specialist in commodity plants. And I would set up, you know, all of their USDA, FDA, the um, global food safety initiative stuff to get them out the door. And then I started working like, you know, I went to farmer's markets and I'd just be chatting with people and they're like, oh, wow, I would love to get my product here or there, but I have to come up with this HACCP plan. I don't know what it is. I don't. And I realized that like with our food system, that the laws that are in place, that they're there for a reason, um, don't aren't always applicable to the farmer's market farmer. And so with my experience growing up on a ranch with a, you know, hillbilly out of Tennessee as my dad, <laughs> and we fixed everything with duct tape and bailing wire, I was like, I could literally be this like gap in between. Yeah, absolutely. So that's when I started working with small scale farms to get them in to be able to, you know, sell at stores and, you know, sell nationwide and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. It's a very reputable thing to do. It's that's one of the biggest challenges I find for the small scale farmer is just all the red tape, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's funny how it varies from state to state. Like down here in Florida, you can legally sell at a farmer's market as long as there's a little like it doesn't have to have a state USDA stamp on it. All it has to say, if you don't do that, it just has to say not for human consumption. Mm-hmm. But like, it's really for human consumption. Like, people buy it and sell it, and it's perfectly safe and wonderful. Right. But it's like in Iowa, like, you can't sell anything that says, like, not for sale on it. Like, it has to have that state stamp. And so uh-huh. it's like, oh, it's the same thing. Like, the butcher inspects it. Like, we inspect it. Everybody that works there in the locker, like, they all inspect it. It's good, safe, and fine. But then I've also toured some of the big, like the, the large scale, like slaughter facilities that go to like, you know, in and out burger is one, is one mm-hmm. of the that I've toured. And then you see like, it's, a, it's a whole new level. Right. Um, and it's funny too, when people are like, Oh, food safety, whatever food safety, big egg. And I'm like, well, sometimes big egg has the most food safety regulations, you know, right. Like, that are like oh I want to drink raw milk from my small scale dairy farm like that's fine but then I mean if you choose that but then at the same time people on large farms you know they're like oh no like we are not going to sell raw like that can kill you you know like you need to kill you need to have pasteurization so Mm -hmm. it's like recognizing people's choice and what's legal and what state and what you can do is always really interesting to me you know what I mean Mm -hmm. I actually just wrote a guide on like relocating for homesteaders and I have I have a whole chart in there that's what all the like food freedom laws are and the homeschool laws and everything for every state and it was really interesting to see how they interpret a lot of that yeah so are you like when you say homesteading are you or a lot of people listening like totally like self-sufficient type oh Okay. No. Look, look at me drinking water out of my Yeti. You know? (laughs) (laughs) I always wonder about that because there's a lot of people that think I'm like that their idea of homesteading is like living off the grid. So, and and I always, I end up clarifying this one a lot is it's a state of mind. 
Okay. And it's kind of where you are. You can anywhere you're at on that scale, like it's a sliding scale. And it's just people are ready to not be completely reliant on the systems anymore. Right. I love that. So I even joke like, you know, homeschoolers, you know, because I write a homeschool curriculum, they'll come to me at homestead or homeschool conventions. And they're like, I love what you're doing, but I'm not really a homesteader. And I'm like, oh, you're homeschooling. You're already like, yeah, you're there because you've opted out of a system. Yeah, exactly. Now, personally, my husband got diagnosed with liver disease six years ago and they told him he had a year to live. And I was like, I don't accept that answer. And so we went from just being kind of, you know, we hunted a lot. We had a small garden and our chickens. We were just, I don't know, I guess normal at the time, you know, Um, you know, of course we always home cooking, but what I didn't realize what we weren't doing is like actual home cooking. Like what I thought was home cooking was not home cooking. Gotcha. Like if I made chicken, you know, homemade chicken noodle soup, I was buying my broth. I was buying my noodles. I was buying my chicken. Now I make chicken noodle soup and it's almost completely from scratch and out of my garden. That must be so delicious. It is amazing. It tastes totally different. And six years later, my husband had a biopsy and they don't see any sign of liver disease. Oh, that's awesome. Congrats to him. I was just going to ask, how is he doing? And sorry to hear about that. And it's always... Um, he's doing great. He's up wrangling pigs at the barn right now. <laughs> oh, I'm glad to hear he's doing better. Though. Yeah. He had, um, two tours in Iraq and was blown up three times. And then like, they think from the burn pits that it just kind of, Oh, wow. That's crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, we completely turned ourselves around by taking that route of being like, we aren't living off grid or anything like that. Like we like our modern conveniences, but right. I love that our farm provides about 80% of our food. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah. Like I actually spoke at a convention recently on homesteading. It was a homeschool convention and people afterwards, they came up there like, we were so excited to see you wore normal clothes. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> what did you expect me to wear? <laughs> but, but yeah. What do you expect me to wear? Yeah. That's funny. I remember growing up my best friend in elementary school was homeschooled. She was, mm-hmm. um, came from a very religious family, um, homeschooled. And I remember being like five or six years old. She was my next door neighbor. And I said, what school do you go to? And she's like, homeschool. And I was like, what's that? And like, it, <laughs> took, it, it took me a long time as a little kid to wrap my head around, wait, you can be taught at home. Like I want to stay <laughs> and then um, my boyfriend in high school was homeschooled and we you know uh, again I think a lot of it with with my experience I don't know what your opinions are on it but it seems that a lot of them come from uh, family backgrounds of religion and faith mm-hmm. right and so so my boyfriend in high school was uh was raised you know Baptist and very like you know religious upbringing and so he was uh um, but yeah, he's like, I get to go to school in my pajamas. And here I am like in public school my whole life going, man, like I'm getting the short end of the stick. <laughs> <laughs> my friend and I were just talking about this the other day. We said, what, what, what is this? Like, like homeschool probably has a lot of benefits because what do we learn in high school that we actually need to use in life? Like, right. especially nowadays with modern technology, it's like, okay, like I understand learning about science and chemistry, but even today, as we can say in agriculture, it's like chemistry. I, I remember learning chemistry in high school and it was like, we learned the periodic table and we had to memorize that, but they didn't, they never applied it to modern day life. So mm-hmm. we learned about, Oh, we're going to add this chemical and this chemical into a beaker and watch it explode. Okay. That was neat. Uh, liquid solids, whatever, but they don't teach you how to apply that in real life situations. It's like, okay, so now we have chemistry. Now we have mm-hmm. chemical, which is cool. But all of a sudden, the second it's applied, chemistry or chemicals are applied to food or, um, you know, whatever uh, products we use on a day-to-day basis, um, all of a sudden it's like bad. Like it's like chemicals are bad, but it's like mm-hmm. chemicals, everything, like even this water is chemicals, it's H2O, it's dihydrogen monoxide. And mm-hmm. that if you say H2O or water, that's, or if you say water, that's not scary, but all of a sudden, if you say dihydrogen monoxide, they're like, what is this scary chemical? It's a scary chemical found hidden in your food. You can make anything sound scary just based on people not understanding chemical makeups and stuff. So all yes. of a sudden you're, oh, there's, um, um, you can make like an ingredient that you can't pronounce, but all it is is a fancy word for like vitamin A, you know, right. or something mm-hmm. like that. Like, okay, like let's not, let's not be too scared. And obviously like eating an apple is better nutritionally than in, like a Twinkie, right? Like, which yeah. is full of chemicals. 
but apples are still made of chemicals like technically yeah (laughs) I think it's like that they don't understand that there's that like there's the like synthesized chemicals when you know they in the in today's world there's some necessity for that but like that's why I say like I toe the line because I understand it but at the same time you know like you know with my husband's medical stuff we have to stay away from those synthesized chemicals because our bodies don't digest them the same way and a lot of times the way they're made is really you know like we're stripping you know our natural resources and stuff like that yeah I don't get into like too too deep of that but there's that like okay like yeah if we're gonna try to like separate it there everything is chemicals yeah let's like like, avoid the synthesized and go for the natural you know yeah it's true for me too I have actually have skin allergies so I'm allergic Mm -hmm. to about 95 percent of cosmetics lotion soaps fragrances stuff like that that's on the Mm -hmm. market every product that I put on my skin I have to go through a um, skin app through my doctors at Mayo Clinic to ensure Mm -hmm. that I use it so I'm allergic to preservatives but it's funny because I know that I'm like the 1%, right? And so whenever Mm -hmm. they think these things are bad and it's like, yeah, I mean, but like, I'm not gonna say, well, just because I have this allergy, everybody else should do this too. Of course, we all want safer stuff, but Mm -hmm. also majority of the public, that stuff is put in there for a reason to like extend shelf life or make it safer or better, or, you know, have a better quality about it or something. I mean, but anyway, I guess (laughs) actually the book I'm writing right now, it's homestead history. And it's kind of a, how we ended up where we're at right now. And it's a full year U S history for kids that just kind of focuses on food and ag. That's awesome. And, but what I've just really found and what I like say a lot is that humans in general, we just can't embrace moderation. Yeah. Unless it's an iPhone. (laughs) Unless it's like, unless it's like the modern day iPhone 14. And even then you're kind of like, okay, this is technology and modern, like, um, oh, did you say moderation? I said moderation. Oh, I misunderstood you. It's okay. Modernization. You said, you said modern, moderation. Moderation. And that's like what we were talking about, the chemicals, like everything in moderation, you know, moderation. I always thought you said modernization. Okay. (laughs) There was the confusion. Yeah. But it's, you know, like we live 45 minutes from town. So we eat most of our food from our house, but man, the kids are so excited when we have to go shopping, like in the next town over and they get fast food. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Once in a while for sure. Mm -hmm. But it's what kids don't, like what are like as a society we just don't get that you don't do it every day yeah exactly and so I think that kind of goes the same with like the chemical conversation like some things they're they've really made it like like I said as homesteaders we're not like anti-everything modernization (laughs) yeah (laughs) that we you know there's that understanding that there's the you know like some of the preservatives like we wouldn't be able to have the diets and things like that that we have without it yeah exactly which is a good thing and a bad thing. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. But, you know, some of it, like, I mean, even some of the modern stuff we do, like the, you know, everyone's like, oh, we don't do it. We we eat all natural and we use our freeze dryer and put everything in mylar bags. And I'm like, great. Where did your freeze dryer come from? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I mean, I want a freeze dryer too. I'm not going to deny it, but. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Um, What all do you grow on your homestead? So we have our dairy cows and then we have a couple of beef cows too. And um, we rotate if they're bred to, well, my two Angus girls, they're always bred to the Hereford neighbor bowl. So, and then we get our beef cow, beef cattle there. The kids show us if we get a steer. Okay. And then um, my dairy girls, I rotate if they're bred to AI with a dairy bowl or if they go to the Hereford bowl as well so that we get our beef from there. Okay, nice. And then we have, of course, our laying hens and our meat chickens, and we raise hogs. Hogs are our big one. I mean, we have 50-something hogs right now. Nice. Good for you We do about 300 piglets through the property a year, whether I sell them as feeders, and we do whole hogs, half hogs, and retail cuts. Cool. And then we have two gardens and an orchard. So what what do you have in your garden primarily? Uh, we do our greens, onions, garlic, broccoli, cauliflower, tomatoes, peppers, squash, corn. So how many Um, hours a day are you spending out in the garden or whatnot? Um, right now, really none. 
Really? Uh, in the early spring, right after I plant everything, it's like every day I have to be out there weeding. Oh yeah. I suppose seasonally. Yeah. Yeah. And then once everything kind of gets to size, like I go out there, my tomato plants, there's a big old weed growing right in the middle of all of them, but it's not hurting anything at this point, you know, Yeah, I might get out there and pull it before it goes to seed, but at the moment it's not hurting anything. Yeah. But when everything's growing, that's when I have to really keep the weeds down. Or like right now I just pulled a whole section and I replanted some greens and they're only like an inch tall. So I have to go out there and weed a lot of that because once they get bigger, the kids can't tell the difference between the weeds and the greens Mm -hmm. and they go out and pick greens and bring in some weird stuff. So (laughs) I feel like, ah, let's go back and learn a little bit more about this plant. Right. Uh, And then we're actually on 40 acres where we, um, like half of it is just wooded. And so we forage a lot of berries there. Like we get our elderberries and our rose hips and service berries, wild strawberries. We have a pond on the property with bass. Oh, wow. um, and we try not to hunt off of our property just because we want to keep the deer here, but we've let the kids get a couple of deer off the property. But other than that, we go up in the mountains and get our deer and elk. Nice. Oh, I love that. I tried being a homesteader doing the gardening thing when I was farming in Iowa and uh yeah I did it for a couple years but then my I got busy with farm babe stuff and traveling or whatnot Mm -hmm. for it anymore but I tell you what it is so much harder than it looks like I give you home setters credit because that's why (laughs) I am how many hours a day do you spend because when stuff's in season oh man it was like you know like the weeds I feel like the weeds just never stopped like right for. And I would see that my neighbors with these beautiful gardens, and I was like, God, I wish my garden looked that good. But then yeah, my every, garden never looks that good. <laughs> yeah, but every time you drive past, they're out there, and they're just like older retired couples that mm-hmm. have because they're retired, and so they just pull weeds all day, which to me sounds like hell. <laughs> you know what? Actually, in this in the summertime when it cools down, my daughter and I go out and we sit and weed and we listen to books like audiobooks. Oh, I love that. And like that's. that's- She'll listen to pretty much anything with me. It's like we listen to, um, have you read the book Dirt? Um, It's the erosion of society or something like that. Um, I feel like I've seen it or heard of it. Do you know who the author is? No, I don't even know where my phone is, but (laughs) um. Yeah, we just read that book and or listened to it. And like, you know, how many other times are you going to get a 14 year old to listen to a four or, you know, absorb a 400 page book on soil erosion? Yeah, no kidding. (laughs) And she was actually like, I hate it when you make me learn. This is really good. (laughs) Ah, that's funny. You have to trick your kids into learning sometimes, right? (laughs) What are the things? So how old are your kids now? Um, so we have a three-year-old, a six-year-old, two 14-year-olds, an 18-year-old, and a 19-year-old. Oh my goodness. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. I, credit. I wouldn't last a week. <laughs> no, nah, me neither. Like my assistant showed up today and she's like, oh my gosh, what happened to your house? And I was like, um, I allow my family to live here. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's crazy. Six, six kids. I don't have any kids and I, they're not for me, but I tell you what, I give a lot of parents a lot of credit because I don't think I could do it. <laughs> yeah. You know, like my three-year-old is a terrorist. Like I yeah. have never met a child or creature like him. Oh, uh, no. He kind of reminds me of Stitch. Like he just growls oh. and bites and like doesn't talk and it's yeah. So oh. last night he had a pair of scissors and like a stack of printer paper. And he like sat there and just shredded the printer paper, but he was good for like an hour and a half. Ah. And I, I was like, I'll allow it. Like I, cause if he, usually if he's quiet, he is like literally dismantling something. Oh my gosh. Um, the other day, like, so we had a puppy that got parvo recently. And so we had her quarantined in the basement and we were, parvo? yeah. What's Parvo? I've never had a dog, believe it or not. Oh, um, no it's kids. Oh, kids. Isn't that weird? Usually it's a death sentence for dogs. It's oh. a, it's a bacterial disease that gets into their intestinal lining and it sloughs their intestinal lining Aww. and they usually die from dehydration actually. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Well, she was good. So, but we were having to give her IVs in the basement and quarantine her from our other dogs and stuff. 
And so she's good now. We've sanitized the basement and we just put all the like equipment away so that in case somebody else got sick or something, we had everything. Well, my three-year-old disappeared a couple days ago. Couldn't find him. And I'm looking for him like outside and I come back in and he has all the stuff to set up an IV and is calling the dog and trying to stick the needle into her leg with like the, he had the tube wrapped around his arm. He's holding the bag. He had the anti-nausea med sitting there and he's trying to get the needle into the dog's leg. Oh my God. And you (laughs) live all the tail. I would have a heart attack. (laughs) Oh my God. Well, with this kid, it's really not that abnormal to catch him doing something like that. So I'm just like. I'm like, well, what are you doing? Like, he never even like watched us do an IV. He just heard us talking about it. Oh my God. Well, in yeah. Case, he looked a little bit more like he knew what he was doing. <laughs> I mean, so that, I mean, he tried to start the tractor the other day and he couldn't get it started. So he was trying to pop the hood and had drug um, jumper cables over. And I'm not talking like our little lawnmower tractor. It was our John Deere 4020. Oh my God. And he like had the jumper cables drug over and he was trying to unhook the thing on the side to pop the hood. And the kid doesn't talk, but can jump the tractor. Oh my God. That is so crazy. I mean, let's just hope that he's going to grow up to be like some super genius inventor, millionaire, businessman, engineer. <laughs> right. So something amazing and not like we're going to have to bail him out of jail, you know? <laughs> right. Right. Oh my God. That's funny. But, you know, it just, it kind of shows, like, the lifestyle we live, you know? Yeah, for sure. So what's next on your horizon for your brand or business or farm? Well, um, you know, I wrote the Homestead Education, Introduction to Homestead Science, which is, it's a full year science curriculum on homesteading um, and small scale farming. It's like 300 pages with a workbook. Um. So uh, Homestead History is coming out in about six weeks, which I don't know when this is going to actually air. So it might already be out by the time people um, hear this. And then um, over the next year, I'm going to be writing like advanced um, animal science, advanced plant science, kind of to take the kids who want to continue with this can take it to the next level. Okay. And then for our farm, we're opening um, a farm store in the spring. Very cool. Congrats. Yeah, so we're right on the Canadian border, like literally like a thousand feet from the border. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah, and raw milk's illegal in Canada. Okay. So, but it's not illegal in Idaho. Okay. Yeah, see. So, (laughs) yeah, so they can, you can take $20 worth of dairy products over the border a day. And it's, it's fine if it's raw, you just can't buy raw milk in Canada. That's so interesting. See another one of those goofy loopholes. Mm-hmm. So having a farm right on the border, people can come over, buy our milk, and take it home with them. Oh, good. Yeah. That's Plus, fun. we're also we're forty five minutes from the closest American town. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. And but there's a pretty big community up here. So, I mean, we have people popping in all the time and buying, you know, sausage and eggs on a Saturday morning and stuff. Um, we're getting a new feed store, but the feed store is still over an hour away and it won't be open on Sundays. So on Sundays, it's almost two hours to a feed store. Oh my gosh. That's so I've already talked to one of the local feed mills and I'm going to have just some grain here, you know, in like 10 pound bags for, you know, the Sunday morning, the kids didn't tell me we were at a chicken feed type thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, then the neighbors are going to sell their hay here as well. Okay, well, that'll be nice. Yeah, so it's going to be like a little bit of everything store, like just the things we need. Yeah, sounds like much needed for a small town, you know? Mm -hmm. That'll be great. And who doesn't like buying local, healthy, and, you know, fresh from the farm and season stuff is the best. Right. And we live in a really unique community, like something like 40% of our community homeschools. Wow. Yeah. And that doesn't include the Mennonites. Okay. So the Mennonites have their own, it's a church school. And we have a lot of Mennonites here. And then a lot of people move to our county to be, you know, the the off-grid, the homesteader, the opting out of systems, that type of thing. So we have a couple of farm stores in our county already, but our county is, I don't even remember, it's huge, Um, but there's only 15,000 people in our whole county. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, How big is your town? Uh, I think there's 2,500 people in town. Okay. 
Um, the rest is out in the county. I'm trying to remember. I know my husband's fire like zone is 350 square miles and he's only in the North County. Wow. So it's a pretty big County. Like it covers the whole, like, if you look at Idaho and like, just cut the top off, like it's that whole County. Okay. So it's pretty big. I'm excited to be out there. I'll be in Idaho in a couple of weeks. I'm, I'm excited to be back out in potato country down there. I'll, well, I'll be in Sun Valley. So. Right. Um, we were just down there, um, recently for a homeschool conference and it's really different, but we were, the kids, the, the kids enjoyed it. Good. So, um, I know that like one of your big things is debunking farm myths. I'd love to hear some of the, like the, like the big ones, like the ones that just everybody is not getting. Yeah. You know, I've been debunking a lot of GMO myths now. Mm-hmm. Since I started, which is really kind of what put me on the map is like giving science a bigger voice in the plant breeding world. Um, mm-hmm. And so like I come from a farm where we were growing GMOs. Actually, we were growing like Monsanto GMOs, believe it or not. And so it's <laughs> because, you know, they're like a big company, right, which is now bought out by Bayer. And I think the anti Monsanto, anti GMO, anti Bayer, whatever you want to look at it is probably one of the biggest. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, it's interesting because as farmers that were growing their seed, um, I I never really met a farmer that didn't like them. (laughs) So it was really weird because I, when I, but I had originally come from a city, right? So living in downtown LA for college and downtown Chicago in my twenties, and then moving from these large urban areas to a small town farm, I had Mm -hmm. moved up too. So when people are like anti-Monsanto, anti-GMO, whatever, I get it because I used to believe it too. There's a lot of misinformation out there in the media. But when I started dating and and moving in with and and living with and farming GMOs, and he's like, you know, Doug, my boyfriend at the time was just like, GMOs do great things for farmers. And everybody in the community was like, what? Like, like I would be online promoting like GMOs and talking about how they allowed us to eliminate insecticides and use safer herbicides and produce more land, more uh, crop on less land. And, um, you know, GMOs are, are a really great thing for a lot of farmers. And um, people would be like, how much does Monsanto pay you to say that? And I was like, we pay them. <laughs> like that's how farming works. It's almost like the, the farmer's voice is completely lost. Like they're under this impression that we are forced to do these things. And like, they believe that GMOs are just drenched in Roundup or they have all these myths. And, um, you know, I, I used to believe that too. But until you actually talk to the farmers and you see like what it used to be like, and you understand what they're spraying and why and when. So like one of the biggest posts I did that went really viral that put me on the map was when I talked about, okay, like, yeah, we, we grow Monsanto GMOs and we spray Roundup. Like, let's just put the elephant in the room, mm-hmm. right? Like, here it is. Let's just, let's just be transparent. I said, yeah, we do. Um, we use 22 ounces an acre. Uh, of herbicide on our fields 22 ounces is less than two beer cans on an area of land the size of a football field and we only spray one day a year maybe two when that crop is very short Mm -hmm. like when that corn for example gets to be about thigh or knee high like we don't spray anymore because we don't need to the corn canopy covers the ground and it shades out the weeds and so people just believe that we're just out there just drenching all these chemicals out there and that we're just spraying and using all this roundup and we're just drenching our crops and it's like the, that couldn't be further from the truth like it's mm-hmm. because of gmos that we are using way less chemicals and so if you talk to farmers and what they were doing in the 70s when they were having to use way more harsh insecticides, all these chemicals, like you used to have to use like eight different chemicals and now we're down to one or two in a much smaller, safer dose. Mm -hmm. So that one is really big. And when you dig in on the money trail, people are like, oh, they would say, oh, how much does big egg pay you to say these things? And I was like, we pay big egg. Like we are farmers and we have to buy seed and chemicals from these big companies. Why are these companies big? Because they make products and sell them. Why do we buy them? Because they work, because they're good. Meanwhile, the organic industry, and again, I have nothing wrong with organics, right? If people want to farm organically or non-GMO or whatever, that's fine. Honestly, like, coming from the food safety like aspect, yeah. I'm like, organic is strictly a paperwork and it's not worth my time. It is. Yeah, it is. Um, I have a lot of uh, organic farming friends and mm-hmm. uh, 
that's basically what they say is they're like, I went from being a farmer to uh, doing paperwork and it is a lot of work to get certified. So I respect mm-hmm. the process, but people don't understand that just because it's organic doesn't mean that it's pesticide free. Organics uh, want to use pesticides as a last resort, but so do conventional. Like none of us mm-hmm. want to go out and spray. Like we hate it. It's expensive. It's time consuming. It sucks. Yeah. Um, it's, it's part of, it's part of it. If we want to have profitable businesses and feed people, mm-hmm. and if we want to protect our plants with pesticide sprays, and I'm talking economies of scale have something to do with it, right? People are like, well, I don't spray. And it's like, well, how many acres do you have? Like a half of an acre. It's like, well, of course you don't spray. You have time to spray off by hand. I've got 2000 acres. Do you want to weed that by hand? Like I didn't yeah. think so, right? And with one- I'm allergic sp- to one of the weeds on our property and we don't know what weed. Oh, really? Like, to the point of anaphylaxis. Oh no. So guess what? I am perfectly happy using Roundup outside of my garden. Yeah, exactly. So well, all of our walkways, all of our everything, you know, all yeah. the way around my garden gets round up in the spring. Absolutely. But then we have, we put things in place like raised beds and stuff. So it's easier to knock the weeds out. And I use sleeves to go out there and weed in the spring and stuff. But like I was saying right now, no, I'm not out there weeding because I'm not touching it. Yeah, no kidding. That's crazy. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. So you know, there's another interesting story about it, right? But it's like, when we're talking about organics, it's like, I live in Florida now where it's really tropical, hot, humid, rain, pest pressure is very high here compared to other mm-hmm. parts. Organics are spraying weekly and they're not using Roundup. They're using stuff that's way more toxic than Roundup in organics. And uh-huh. so again, I've got nothing wrong with organics, but people believe based on marketing and activists, and they're not actually getting their information direct from commercial scale growers. And so that's a big one. But the organic industry, the non-GMO project, when people are against big corporations and big ag and big business and government, I get that. And I can agree to that to a certain extent as well. But like, if you think that the government also has your best interest at heart when it comes to labels like organic and non-GMO, like I have an oceanfront property in Idaho to sell you. You know what I mean? Right. And like, it's like the same. It's like the government's against us. The government is destroying us. The government is killing everything. The big egg is destroying the soil. I better eat organic. But the people that own the organic companies are the same or corporations you're railing against. The government mm-hmm. oversees organic. So if you can't trust organic, if you can't trust yeah. GMO because it's government, how can you trust organics? Because it's government. It's actually more government. That's there's, why, like, I always more. tell people just get to know your farmer exactly if you don't want to eat food that is controlled by the government or if you need to you know moderation um get all your meat from a local farmer and get you know I mean it's people come to my house and they're like to buy hogs and they're like are you organic are you you know and I'm like no no I do what's I do what's best for my animals. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Same. And organic, a lot of, t- I, I actually do not agree, agree with organic animal farming at all, but oh, yeah, um, I know. I, I, I've been to some really great farms that they have like an organic herd and a natural herd. So if they have to give medications to their organic animals, they just move them over to the natural herd. Great. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But small scale organic farming of animals can actually be like, I think it's so cruel. Yeah, I agree. I I know some of those too. And it's like, well, what do you do if you have to treat? Oh, we give them this medicinal um, vitamin based, whatever. And Mm -hmm. they just go on the burn pile. And um, yeah, it's cool because you could use modern medicine to save them. Mm -hmm. Like if kids were sick, would you just be like, well, here's a vitamin. And if it doesn't work, we're just going to let you die. So Um, like with my pigs, for example, like when I, um, every, in, unless I have someone specifically not ask, like ask for us not to do it for a piglet they're buying every pig. When I wean it, they get wormed because mm-hmm. as soon as you take them off mom, as soon as you take them off the farm, their immune systems plummet. And what people don't understand is there's always a worm load. It's about controlling that worm load with healthy animals. Yeah. Yeah. And so the rest of the year I use natural preventative measures. My mm-hmm. sows, I haven't wormed a sow and I don't even know how long because I don't right. need to. Right. You know, they, I, a couple times a year, I'll throw some diatomaceous earth over their food. They get pumpkins in the fall, so on and so forth. I don't need to worm my sows because I have a healthy herd. 
Yeah, exactly. But those piglets, I'm going to worm them unless you tell me not to, because, yeah. and if, and I even tell people, if you live locally and you decide not to worm them and you get them home and they're sick, you call me and I'm going to come and worm your pig. Yes, exactly. I know. And the, and we all care <clears throat> best and, you know, the, the best thing to do for our animals. And I think sometimes people get lost in that common sense. Mm-hmm. You know? well, these GMOs are so bad. And it's like, well, who told you that? It's like the organic and non, the non-GMO project is a $19 billion a year label. And, yeah. and their goal is to sell you products. Organic is there to sell you more expensive products. So it's found- I mean, even like the USDA label is under the USDA marketing. It is. I mean, it marketing. says it right there. It says it right there. It's marketing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And something like, Three billion dollars a year is spent uh, putting making GMOs sound bad, like the Organic Consumers Association and Whole Foods and Stonyfield Organic and all these companies and non-GMO project. There's they're funneling three billion into the anti-GMO movement, and that's who's funding it. And so it's kind of like follow the money. The organic industry publicly announces their shill campaigns, like they're they're the ones out there saying, "Hey, sign up for this." Um, and they're the ones that are out there. There's this really great report called the Organic Marketing Report. And it's, mm-hmm. they, they did 25 years worth of research into organics marketing and what that means and who's behind it and how they purposely target young mothers, as one example, in fear-based marketing. Fear sells, especially when people don't know what a GMO is. They yep. don't know anything about chemistry. They don't know anything about farming. And who can blame them? Nobody really knows mm-hmm. a farmer or it's why you and I do what we do. Exactly. Um, but it's like, like, oh my gosh, when you dig in on the misinformation and it's, it's the same with animal rights stuff too. I think there's a lot of similarities in anti-GMO and anti-meat is it's very loud vocal minority voices that are putting out disinformation campaigns mm-hmm. that are also very well funded. Like PETA's not broke. Like no. H- U.S. lobbies $140 million a year to try to put people like you and me out of business. Like mm-hmm. this very passionate group that doesn't want us to eat animals. And like, it's, I've been attacked. Like so many people are attacked for having a different viewpoint. And it's like, can't we just realize that we can have different, it's a different diet. Like you do you and I'll do me. Like mm-hmm. I will never eat. Like I get so cranky without meat. Um, and I, and I, it's good for you and it's nutritious and whatever. Right. So I just, that's what I choose to do. Um, actually, I just had a dairy farm run recently and we had that conversation about, you know, those PETA videos of them, you know, moving down cows with a forklift and stuff. Well, how do you suggest I move a down cow? Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and like, wouldn't I love to just call it like a dog <laughs> and be like, it's like, that's like, not how it works. Like, like you have to use a forklift. I mean, that's, that's how you get them up. And a lot of times they're using those forks to get them to stand up. And that's, what's bracing them while they get their room and moving again and stuff. Yeah. But they add that dreary filter and that Sarah McLachlan <laughs> song and they add the sadness and the feeling. And all of a sudden now it's not, it's not helping an animal. It's an emotional charge, sad video. And it's like, you can make anybody feel anything by doing the right music and the right voice and the right, right. or in this case, wrong. Right. And they'll, and they'll also take footage and recycle it or use outdated stuff or stuff from other countries. Like I've yep. seen people recycle the same video saying this happened on a farm in Wisconsin, this happened on a farm in North Carolina. And I was like, wait a minute. I've seen this video before. This is the exact same video. Just and wasn't it the one out of Southern California that that farm actually got shut down because of how they were treating animals? Well, and that's the other thing too. It's like, if you are not a good farmer, and of course there's bad people in every industry, right? Yeah. And if bad things do happen, like absolutely they deserve to be shut down. But for them to think that this is like industry standard cruelty is like, that just really grinds my gears because if only they mm-hmm. understood People like you caring for a dairy cow is always going to put that dairy cow's needs before your own. Like Mm -hmm. you sleep until that cow's okay. Right. And everybody that raises livestock, like we know that, like this is our Mm -hmm. culture. And for people to think, oh, like these, you know, farmers just don't care. And it's like, if we didn't care, like our reputation would go down the drain, we'd go out of business. Like we're not going anywhere. 
Like, you know, once, yeah. once the name is tainted, you're screwed. Like you will get, nobody will buy your products, including the corporate, corporate yeah. type or the big, the big farms, they go through audits. The biggest farms have the most audits. Like if you want to mm-hmm. sell for cheese to McDonald's, you're audited by like five different companies. Like, oh yeah. So- when I, I worked for a walnut processing plant. It was, we were working on our um, global food safety initiative. I don't remember which one we were doing, the SQF. It's been a few years. Yeah. It was literally two file cabinets and a whole bookshelf full of paperwork to show that we did everything safe, healthy, oh, you know, yeah. All, yeah. I mean, all the way down to like how our, our employees were treated, how our customers were treated. I mean, every single detail of everything was documented. It is so insanely detailed. Just mm-hmm. yesterday, the tobacco farm, and like way outside of the tobacco farm, there was a dead moth on the ground. And she jokingly said, Oh, there's a food safety violation. And it was like, because it's so strict. And mm-hmm. it's, like, it's like, first of all, it's tobacco. Second of all, it's a it's a dead moth that's nowhere near anything, but it's right. like safety violation because everything's a safety violation. I was talking. I actually, I had an auditor one time we were outside and I'm like, yeah, we're having a mouse issue because we were right by fields. I mean, there was nothing we could do about it completely. They weren't coming into the place, but I mean, it was just a constant issue. And, um, he goes, you know, coming over here with a 22 and a six pack at night would handle that. Just don't document it. Oh my God. (laughs) I was like, Good plan. Yeah, keeping it real. <laughs> right. The thing that drives me crazy about some of, and it's again, I don't have anything against vegans, right? Like, if mm. you don't want to eat, don't eat meat. I don't care what you eat. Just, Just as long eat. as you're not eating meat because you're actually educated as to why you're not eating meat. Yes. And like, and then, yeah, if it's like, just, I don't like the taste or the texture, I don't want to eat an animal, like, fine. I respect that decision, but yeah. I just don't when it's because of misinformation. And the other thing too, is like, when you are like a large scale commercial farmer, especially, or even a gardener, a hobby scale, whatever, you know, you're killing animals. Like you're putting out, you know, you're taking care of rabbits and uh, mice and deer and, and snakes and whatever all. And so it, the quote from Yellowstone, that TV show is actually kind of a good one when he's up against the vegan activists and he's going, well, how cute does an animal have to be for you to kill it? You know? And they're like, we, we can't eat this and we can't eat that. And it's like, oh, but these animals died for your vegan diet and that's okay. And yeah. it's like, everything dies. People used to ask me that at farmer's markets, they'd say, how can you eat? You know, you raise these animals and I raise lambs, right? Lambs are adorable. Um, they're also delicious. And I love- They're also kind of dumb. So by the time you're ready to butcher them, you're like, out yeah, of my life. They're really <laughs> dumb. Yeah. Um, and- cute I mean but I always say I love I just bought two underweight lambs from fair so oh my gosh but we're gonna feed them out and butcher them I love them from birth to burger right so no matter what kind (laughs) of animal you have whether it's a cat dog chicken pig cow lamb you love that animal the same Mm -hmm. but the only difference they all die right like it can Mm -hmm. be sad put down your favorite cow or your favorite lamb or your favorite dog but everything dies it's just part Mm -hmm. of it it just so happens that when some things die, they have recipes. Like that's the only difference. Right. Well, that's, I, I have this like guide on how to cull animals off your property. Cause it's like, just because they've reached the end of their time with you doesn't mean you just take them out to the back 40 and shoot them. Right. right. Yeah. You know, sometimes they're going into the freezer. Sometimes they're getting a new job. Sometimes they're going to the neighbor's farm, you know? Yep. yep. Exactly. And two, you know, it, I think scale matters too. Like I remember, I don't know what your thoughts are on having a smaller herd. Well, you know, oh, you have 300 pigs. That's right. I said, but yeah, I mean, we had about 500 head of cattle and about, you know, 200 ish head of sheep with lambs at Mm -hmm. our peak. You know, you're raising the seven, 800 animals. And when they run past, they just have numbers, you know, but, but if I had like a small herd where you only had like five or six, that would be harder because then you know their names and personalities. And it's kind of like, ah, but, That's uh, like our, we only have nine sows, but then we do, yeah. you know, we get 300 piglets a year, you know? So my sows, they all have names and they get treats and sometimes they have names to reflect their personalities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kind of like, you know, heifer number 27, you're done with her, you yeah, know? Yeah, exactly. 
I actually have my two Angus girls. They are pains in the butt. And so I named them Thelma and Louise. Uh, but my husband still calls them 10 and 11 because that's their (laughs) ear tags oh yeah when number 168 went for burgers I was happy about that one she was a bitch she wanted to kill me for sure (laughs) that's actually we we have a we have a sow we call her fat bitch and (laughs) I mean she is huge and like from the day she's bred her stomach is dragging like I'm just like but she has like 17 piglets at a time so I'm like we'll keep you for a minute you know oh my gosh it's crazy so what breed is she uh we got her off of a commercial farm so she's um like York and Landres and I think some Duroc in there and then I breed her to um I have a Hereford boar right now okay but yeah, and I'm like, you know, at 150 a pop, like if I sell them as piglets, you know, and then even more if I feed them out, like, yeah, I'll yeah. keep you around, you know, but she's yeah. not very friendly and she just lays around all the time. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think, but I think those are some of the biggest myths, you know, as, and also speaking of pork is um, hormones, right? I think that's another big one when people are like, mm-hmm. oh, I need this uh, hormone-free pork or hormone-free chicken. And it's like, hormones are not even used in pork, pork and poultry. So like who in the government allows people to just put these bullshit labels on things? And it's like- Right, like the antibiotic-free, everything has to be antibiotic-free. Yeah. So it's like, you know, GMOs are good. Everything we eat is modified. There's no such thing as natural. Organic doesn't mean sprayed. Like, but at the end of the day, if you understand the science behind our food supply, we have a really great story to tell. Like Mm -hmm. the fact that we're producing more crop on less land because of modern plant breeding, whether it's GMO or non-GMO, that's another myth. There's only 10 GMOs. So people are like, oh, look at all this stuff that's non-GMO. It's like, well, yeah, there's only 10 GMOs, which is mostly your junk You're like, you're like, that plant was never a GMO, but that's great. Great that it's GMO free. So like most of our GMO crops are going to be like in your junk foods, right? Because it's corn, soy, sugar beets, canola, and everything else. If you're having like lettuce and grapes and, you know, apple, no, there is a GMO apple, Mm -hmm. um, stuff like that. It's, it's kind of like, um, you know, berries or something. They're all selectively bred, but, you know, not even. That's another one is people don't know the difference between selective breeding and non-GMO. Right. And there's like tons and tons of plant breeding methods. So it's like, why do you have a problem with herbicide tolerance, cisgenic, uh, or mutagenesis that's allowed in organic, but you have a problem with transgenic or why do you, and you ask those questions, the people that understand from the science community and like the, they get it, but the average person would just look at you like with a blank stare and just go, I don't know, Monsanto Roundup. And then you're like, but like, what about all the other chemical companies? Monsanto's not even, a, first of all, they don't even exist anymore. Second of all, they haven't been a chemical company since the 90s. And third of all, there are like a ton of farm chemical companies out there. How come Syngenta, BASF's like logo, a slogan is literally, we create chemistry and nobody's ever heard of them. They're the biggest, like, you know, Chem China. They're, these are the biggest chemical companies. Mm-hmm nobody's heard of them all they ever hear is monsanto roundup i don't know and it's like oh my god you guys what's what the other chemistries that are out there are way worse but the good news is that everything is such a minimal dose because it's always the dose makes the poison to your point earlier of like everything in moderation Mm -hmm. like so if you're using six ounces an acre of an insecticide in your field six ounces is like half a water bottle half a water bottle um an area of land the size of a football field. So when people are like worried that there's pesticide residues, it's like, yeah, maybe if you eat like 1500 servings in a single sitting, you'd have to worry about it, but like just wash your produce and you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're, um, we're making really great strides though. You know, we're being better with the environment. We're being better with animals, we're being better with plants. Um, we're using safer chemistries, better herbicides, um, all these great things. But like good news doesn't always sell in the media as much as like bad news where that makes media headlines, you know? That's exactly what it is. So we're getting close to the end of our time. My favorite question to ask everybody is what does keep growing mean to you? Keep growing. I think just growing in life, growing in personal development and professionally, um, professionally, personally, and just keep on keeping on doing what you love and constantly look for ways to improve and be happy. 
I love it. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Would you like to tell everyone where they can find you? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. So my website is thefarmbabe.com and you can find Farm Babe on Facebook and I am at the Farm Babe on everything else. So find your favorite platform. I'm on it, whether it's at the Farm Babe on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, X, since it's not Twitter anymore. Now Twitter is now called X, which really bothers me, but whatever. I think it's really funny that you can literally say I'm on X. I'm on X. <laughs> I never thought of that. <laughs> That's so funny. At the farm babe on X. Uh, don't, you know, you're going to edit that. <laughs> so I'm just kidding. But like, you can find the farm babe on everything, but the farm babe.com. Um, and that's where you can learn more about my speaking and watch my videos and read my articles and, uh, yeah, my influencer stuff and speaking and all that good stuff. There's lots of videos too, to learn more, but thanks for all having right. me. I love it. Thank you so much. And I hope to chat again soon. Yes, you as well. Thanks. Did you enjoy today's episode? If so, please head over to your favorite podcast player and leave a comment and review. This helps me to know what you're enjoying and helps others find an episode that can help them. Thank you for joining me today at the Homestead Education, and I hope that I have given you something to think about this week. To help others find me, please comment and leave a review on your favorite podcast player. You can also follow me on Facebook at the Homestead Education and Instagram at homestead underscore education. Do you have questions that you would like answered or just want to say hi? Please email me at hello at the homesteadeducation.com. Until next time, keep growing.